welcome. Welcome to our professional development webinar series. Uh, it's co-presented with the American Composers Forum. Hi, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Um, and uh, we want to welcome today composer Melissa Dunphy, publicist and manager Elizabeth Dworkin, each who are founders of their own companies, as well as publisher Caroline Chung from Boozy and Hawks. And um, to the audience, welcome to all of you, and please let us know where you're calling from. Um, just a few tech reminders about Zoom. It's best to keep it in speaker view, which you can find, I believe, in most computers at the top right-hand corner of the video. Uh, but if not, then you can investigate and see where it's best on your device. Um, please keep yourself muted and your video off. Uh, I've heard it said that unmute is the new reply all, so um, take that for what it's worth. But if you do really want to reply all, use the chat function to interact with your fellow attendees and with the panelists. And there'll be time for a Q&A at the end of the webinar, so we'll get to that at the end. Uh, thank you to the American Composers Forum, as I said. Thank you to the Virginia B. Tolman Foundation. Uh, thank you to NISCA. Thank you to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and to our individual donors for helping fund this series. And thank you so much to the ACO staff, especially Aiden Feldkamp, who's been so uh, essential at organizing these, uh, these uh, particular webinar series. Um, I would like now to introduce our moderator, composer, educator, and ACO board member, Jonathan Bailey Holland, whose gorgeous orchestrations we heard premiered at our most recent Carnegie Hall concert, two Charles Ives songs for mezzo-soprano Jamie Barton, uh, shortly before COVID hit. Jonathan has been commissioned and performed by many orchestras, the Atlanta Symphony, Baltimore, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Dallas, Detroit, I guess you could call that the A, B, C, and D of the orchestra world. He studied composition with Ned Roram at the Curtis Institute and got his PhD from Harvard University. Currently, he is chair of composition, contemporary music, and core studies at Boston Conservatory at Berkeley with two E's. Welcome to our moderator, Jonathan Bailey Holland. Thanks, Derek. Uh, it's great to be here. Great to be here talking about this topic that is super important. Um, and I am going to invite my panelists who will be uh, joining me on the conversation today to introduce themselves uh, before we jump into some questions. So Carol Ann, I'll pass it to you. Thanks so much, Jonathan. And thank you to ACO, ACF for having me on this panel. It is totally um, wonderful to be here. Uh, so. My name is Carol Ann Chung. I am the Director of Marketing and Publicity at Boozy and Hawks, where I have the privilege of working with really incredible composers and uh, working on the promotion of their music. Passing on. Hi, uh, I'm Melissa Dunphy. <laughs> I'm a composer based here in Philadelphia. Uh, I mostly self-publish my works uh, using my own publishing company, Mormalike Press, uh, but I've also had some works published by traditional uh, publishers um, like E.C. Shermer. Uh, yeah, and I teach uh, composition at Rutgers. I have a PhD from Penn and uh, went to Westchester University for my Bachelor of Music. Hi everybody, I'm Elizabeth Dworkin, and as Derek said, I'm the uh, founder and CFO of uh, Dworkin and Company. Going on our 30th anniversary this year, we've been um, privileged to work with a lot of extraordinary composers and a lot of performers that um, are very well-rounded but have a have a focus toward new music. So we encompass a lot of the the music world from both sides of the stage. Great, thank you all. Um, and uh, you know, this is a very important topic for composers. Once we have figured out how to write our music and get it in, in just the right order, um, the next most important task is sharing it with the world. And so today's topic is um, essential for all composers. We wanna focus on publishing and promotion in terms of writing for orchestra, um, which, feels a little surreal at the moment, um, but I think much of what we'll talk about 
is applicable even beyond um, writing for orchestra, but just sort of how do you get your your music out into the world? Um, so I think we'll jump right in to some questions. Uh, and I want to ask questions of our panelists um, based on sort of the, the worlds in which they um, inhabit. So I'll start, Caroline, with you. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how Boozy and Hawks serves its composers, um, and in particular, those writing for orchestra, and kind of more specifically, um, just curious, like what does a publisher handle for a composer? Is it just distribution? Um, do you deal with contracts? Do you deal with licensing? Um, what's involved with that? Great. Yes, I can totally dig into that. I think the easiest way for me to break down all the things that a publisher does traditionally uh, is to go through the different teams at Boozy and Hawks. So here at Boozy, we have uh, three major teams. We have editorial, promotion, and uh, rental grand rights licensing. Okay. So for the editorial team, I think probably a lot of people on this call already know what editors do, but essentially we have this stellar team of editors. They receive all of the music from our composers and they basically make it ready for performance or they're ready for publication. Um, they'll ingest this music. If, if they have to, they will engrave it. Um, they'll go through it with a fine tooth comb and ask any questions if needed, like, well, you put a slur here, you didn't put slur there, you know, that, that type of questions just to make sure all right, we are really articulating the vision of the composer and making sure that it is as easy as possible for a, a performer receiving the music to understand exactly how to execute um, the intention of the composer, right? So the second team I mentioned is the promotion team and that's the team that I'm on. And uh, the promotion team's job is essentially we tried to, get as many performances as possible for our catalog. That's what, that's what we focus on. Of course, we are promoting in general, the music of our, of our composers, but um, most, most, most specifically, we are really trying to get as many performances as possible. Um, we have a sort of two-prong approach at Boozy and Hawks, which is kind of unique to us, and we can get into that later. Um, on one hand, we have our director of promotion, Elizabeth Blaufox, and what she does, she, she works um, on establishing really close relationships, individual relationships with artists and arts administrators and conductors, having conversations with them, talking to them about our music, but also um, hearing from them, what do they need? What are they looking for? What are their tastes? And a lot of promotion, really is about matchmaking. It's not like shoving your music down someone's throat. It's about understanding what, what, would it, what are you looking at? And hey, we've got great music for you. Um, so Elizabeth also, her team is also working on composer management and she's also negotiating commissioning contracts, finding co-commissioners, um, big job. Uh, so that's her side of promotion. And the other prong that I mentioned is our marketing communications. And so that's, that's uh, the part of the, 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 the team that I field. And so where Elizabeth is really one-on-one -on -one developing those conversations uh, in, a more, in a more individual respect, I'm doing real broad strokes type of promotion. So that means e-blasts, e-newsletters, um, social media, videos, um, PR is another part of what I'm working on. Um, so meaning whenever our composers have a big premiere coming up or a major project, I'm part of that rollout to make sure we get as much coverage as possible, much traction, um, get our composers' names out there. Okay, that was a lot on promotion. Uh, I'm biased. And then we have our wonderful, wonderful rental and grand rights licensing team. And uh, so they are in charge of um, licensing. They are in charge of getting uh, rental materials out to different um, orchestras, talking with their librarians to get their needs um, met and uh, working with them on the rental fees, um, determining those fees for the individual orchestras as well. And very importantly, this past year, it's meant uh, uh, talking about streaming with all of these orchestras as well. 
and negotiating that. So that's it's been a big job. It's a big pivot for them. Uh, we also have other staff at the company that handles mechanical licensing, print licensing. Um, we have a syncs team as well that works with music supervisors to pitch over parts of our catalog to get uh, synced for film, ads, TV. So I know that was a, that was a huge list, that, but essentially what I'm trying to get across is there are so many different ways that you can monetize your music and, and the responsibility of the publishers to, to really optimize that. It's great to, to just learn about all the different aspects of publishing. I mean, it goes much farther than I think what we traditionally think of a publisher doing for a composer. Um, I'm curious too, in terms of um, selling composers works, I know that you know publishers may sell them directly, but do you which which department would work with like uh, a music retailer, for instance? Well, Boozy and Hawks. Sorry, no, we're ahead, stepping over you. So ahead. Boozy and Hawks is a print distributor in the states. Is Hal Leonard. So we have a you know our promotion team will work with them to make sure, and and our editorial team works very closely with them on getting those print publications out and along with their schedule. And they have a whole team themselves of marketing and promotion whenever there's a new publication and getting that into the hands of educators or whatever the market is for, for any given publication. Great. And would you say that um, all major publishers have a similar um, distribution of tasks? Oh, you mean the breakdown of the different teams? Uh, sure. I think, yeah, so I mentioned, what did I say? Editorial promotion and uh, rental grand rights licensing. Yeah, that's pretty standard for the major okay. publishers. The only difference, um, which, I, which I mentioned before, was that most publishers don't have necessarily a, an in-house publicist, a marketing person, so that makes me super special. Um, <laughs> but at Boozy's, Boozy's team identified, maybe it was about 10 years ago, um, a real need to um, have somebody pushing out our, our composers' works uh, to, to the press to get it in the media and having that really wrap into our promotion plan, like working very closely with our, our promotion director um, to make sure all of our messaging and promotion strategy for the year is really tied together. Great. So to pass it over to Melissa, um, who's here to sort of talk about self-publishing, that's a lot that a publisher does for a composer. So as a self-publisher, how much of that are you taking on? Are you doing some version of all of that? Do you have other people that assist you? I, um, uh, I definitely started as someone who um, does all of that myself and like a little bit about my personal journey which maybe uh relates to why I made a very sort of deliberate decision from the very beginning of my career that I wanted to self-publish largely uh, I came to composing late to the game as you might say I started composing when I was like 24 25 I started my bachelor of music when I was 26 and uh right before I actually uh left the workforce to go back to college I was uh, director of public relations for a nonprofit theater um so I'm very used to the grind of promotion. I actually think it's interesting that, you know, I agree with you, Caroline, in that promotion, I actually think is the most important of all of those, all of those sections. Like no offense to your no, colleagues. No one else is, yeah, let's, let's not have them. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm no offense <laughs> to them, but like for me personally, you know, promotion is so important and so, um, draining like personally difficult to do if you're trying to be a creative artist at the same time but I have experience doing that anyone who's ever worked in telemarketing also has experience doing that I know a lot of artists have had those kinds of jobs as well um so you know for me it was a matter of I know that I am my best my own best advocate for publicizing my own works. Um, I feel and I feel comfortable as an engraver. I think, you know, most composers now who are using Sibelius and Finale and Dorico are very comfortable engraving their own works. They know how it's supposed to look. They're not having to rely upon an engraver. Um, you know, uh, and then the administrative side of it also, you know, 
can also be a lot of work sometimes if you're communicating with clients all the time. I know some composers don't do that very well or find that really irritating, like switching between creative brain and business brain many times a day. Uh, but I knew that that was something that I wanted to handle. And one of the big reasons that I made a decision to handle all of that myself, and it's a big one, um, is that when you publish a piece of music, almost 100% of the time, with traditional uh, publishers, I think it is 100% of the time, you give up the copyright to your work. Uh, this is like a kind of a philosophical thing for me. Um, I, I feel like a lot of my work is very personal and I felt uncomfortable when faced with a contract that was like you are signing over ownership of that work to a company that is not you and you lose some control of it that way. The payoff, of course, is that you have teams of people to do all of this other work for you and put all of that together. But I think that this is something that, you know, each composer has to decide for themselves um, what is what they're most comfortable with. I'm going to drop a uh, a link into the chat, which is, oh my gosh, it's like 11 years old now, but it is from my composer friend, John Mackey. Many of you may know John Mackey. He's a uh, very online and a fun, awesome person to talk to. I read this link back in 2009 when I was an undergrad at Westchester University, and it had an enormous impact on me. Um, just thinking through, you know, what I wanted to do with my career and how I wanted it to go. Um, and uh, so, yeah, for anyone who's sort of curious and wants to read that, John Mackey publishes a lot of his work too. As I've come on as a composer, I have recognized that there are some areas where I don't have the expertise to do all of the things that a publisher would do. Um, and for me personally, uh, uh, I hit my wall, I guess you could say, when I started writing a lot of sacred music. I have no idea how to reach out to, uh, sacred, to church choirs and to, you know, that community of people. I don't have connections to it myself. So I had some pieces published through EC Sherma through Morningstar and they have those connections. They're able to do that promotion. They're able to do that liaising with people. Um, and uh, that's worked out very well for me. I trust them. I think that's a really important thing is as a composer, you should have a very personal relationship with your team at the publisher. You need to trust them because as I said, you're signing over your babies, your music to them. So you need to trust them. You need to know that they care about your music as much as you do and that they're going to go out there and do the work promoting and you know all of the business work that's necessary um but there are still some works that i'm like no matter what publisher came to me and asked me to publish that i don't think that i would let go of that you know what i mean so it's a very personal choice and, and melissa i wonder if you could talk a little bit about um rental of music do you handle rental and how do you go about all of that so i am a little bit radical in the way that i distribute my scores um uh, something that i'm going to drop another link into the chat uh this is something a, a link that was a really helpful link actually for anyone who's thinking of self-publishing from uh, soprano lisa nea on, in on the west coast who basically does a run through of all of the music distributors that you as a self-published composer could partner with to distribute your self-published scores so they're not publishing your scores they're not taking they're not um you know in charge of the copyright they don't do the work of necessarily of a uh, promotion but they are a platform that you can use to get your work out there and right at the bottom of the article, here's me coming in, tossing grenades, saying, hey, my model is totally different to any of this. I realized very early on in my career that the vast bulk of my income comes from two sources. Uh, by far the greatest source is commission fees. So when someone commissions me to write a piece of music, I get a chunk of money, that's the vast bulk of my income. The secondary part of my income that I get uh, is performance royalties. So when someone, uh, in my case, ASCAP, uh, collects performance royalties from venues, groups, whatever, and I get a check in April that, uh, you know, is a pretty good sizable second chunk of my income. The lowest, for me, chunk of my income, uh, when I first began, I was selling scores online, you know, paper scores and, and PDFs of scores. That was like way, way down. Like I was lucky if I was earning, you know, 500 bucks a year, max, max, like... <laughs> Um, and I realized that there's a kind of a tension 
between these two sources of income. If I want to get more performances and more commissions, I need the easiest access to my sheet music that is, you know, humanly possible. And uh, for some instances, that might be going through a publisher because, you know, institutions like schools or colleges go to publishers and go to distributors to get their music. But for a lot of other things, you know, it, it, putting your music out there for free as a download from your website so that anyone can take a look at your music without any kind of, you know, payment or anything will distribute your music as freely as possible. So I kind of changed my whole business model and said, here is my sheet music. I'm putting it on my, we on my website free of charge. You can download it as much as you like. You can print it out yourself at home. There's no DRM protection or anything. If you want to perform it, shoot me an email. It's an honest, it's an honor system. And uh, at that point, either I'll waive the charge to buy the sheet music or I'll charge you a nominal sum that's, you know, pretty like comparable to what people would uh, pay for an electronic score. Um, what I'm most interested in is you performing that piece of music. And uh, so I don't charge rental fees. I don't uh, tell orchestras who are, you know, performing my or orchestral work or chamber music musicians or whatever um, that you have to charge me, uh, pay a rental. And then at the end of that rental time, you have to give me back the sheet music. I'm like, here's the PDF, go forth and multiply <laughs> that PDF. When you perform that music, here's my one condition. When you perform that music, send me a program so that I can send that to ASCAP and I can get my performance royalties on the back end and we're good to go. And then when, if you love my model, if you think I'm really generous, think about commissioning me one day, that's it. <laughs> you know, you've touched on, I think a topic that we could probably spend an entire hour, hour on in and of itself. Um, and especially nowadays that we've suddenly all embraced the um, technology that we've been embracing but didn't want to admit to you in the last year. Um, I can remember a conversation I had with um, Judith Illica from Presser um, who said, you know, if the janitor who's gonna be cleaning the bathrooms after the reading session is gonna get paid, the composer should absolutely get paid. So I think, you know, there are opinions um, far and wide on either side of that issue of how to get your music out there, but definitely okay. um, um, something that, especially as a self-publisher uh, is something to consider. Um, Elizabeth, I want to bring you into the conversation too. Um, so not coming from the, oh, Caroline wanted do you, to. Do you mind if I just jump so quickly? The sure, quickest sure. seconds. I just wanted to clarify one thing that um, Melissa, you had brought up about um, composers maintaining their ownership. And it's a very, very important point to make. Um, so with publishers, it, it doesn't necessarily always have to be 100%. There's all different types of deals that we do sign with composers, some of whom do keep their copyright. And But then, you know, you, you really have to make contracts that really suit both parties. And uh, I can't say how, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the model of everything that you were describing, Melissa, is so extraordinary and so interesting. And I think that's such a great point that, you know, if, if you had, been signed with a publisher, that type of model wouldn't necessarily be, you wouldn't be able to negotiate that type of a, a, a method with, with them because they have a certain way of doing their things. So I, I so much respect. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not saying this to be like down with publishers, do it. You know, I'm, it's, <laughs> It's different strokes for different composers. I, you know, like I said, I have a relationship with EC Shoma and I love the folks at EC Shoma. They have been awesome. I am so happy They're to work wonderful. with them. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, you know, there, it's almost on a per piece basis for me. And I also think each composer has to make that decision. What kind of work are you prepared to do on the back end? You know, if it's none, you need to get a publisher. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great That's point. Yeah, that's a great point too, that um, even for an individual composer, it's not an all or nothing proposition. It may make sense to have part of your catalog handled one way and part of your catalog handled a different way. Um, Elizabeth, I'd love for you to, to jump in here and talk about how as a, a publicist, you fit into the equation, um, both in terms of composers who may have publishers, composers who may not have publishers, um, and even just how a composer would get connected to a publicist. 
Well, we actually, I agree with everything that, that you both said. I mean, you hit a lot of the points that, that I would also hit. And I would say that my office is a little bit unusual, not as much anymore as it used to be when I started 30 years ago, you had management offices and PR offices, but I've always felt like everything works better if it's all under one roof. And the management side and the PR side really need to work together as, as you were saying, well, you were both saying, um, for a good promotion plan. And uh, we do a lot of the same things that, that you were both describing for composers. Um, composers who have other jobs who wanna focus on music or who get to a point where they don't want to be promoting themselves anymore. Because sometimes I can say something that they can't say. Or I can, you know, when it comes to negotiating a contract, we actually do contracts for most of our artists. Um, I mean, composers also, even the ones with publishers. And we work extremely closely with somebody's publishing team. And it can only be better. But, you know, the publishers have a lot of people that they're promoting a lot more than we do. And sometimes it can't be the same you know, degree of uh, intensity to a, to a PR plan or a promotion plan of any sort. So we do a lot of that as well. And we do the same things. We talk to orchestras all the time. We're talking to them about our performers anyway. And uh, we put a lot of projects together. We, you know, develop and produce projects. And it's, it's sort of all the worlds coming together at that point. And the other thing that I've, I don't know how you, both feel about this, but the thing that I've discovered too is that a lot of people in the orchestral world or the chamber world or whatever don't know a lot about new music and they don't know a lot about commissioning a piece and how it all works. I have had incredibly, you know, well respected, uh, important agents and, you know, artistic administrators and people like that who had no clue about composer contracts or all of the fine details on it. So it's useful to, to guide people on that. And we do a lot of that. And we also do develop a campaign as um, Carol was talking about, um, you know, and the more that you can feed any of these PR offices in orchestras or even with the publishers, um, the better it is for everybody. Because if you can, you know, if you're clear and direct and creative about what you're doing, um, I think you have a better chance. And I always believe of going beyond the usual classical music um, journalists and media. It's wonderful. You have to, you know, do all the basics. But I think to go beyond it is um, can be more interesting and, and more fun. And there's not always time for other people to, to find that. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, I wonder. I, I want to open this up to to any of you on the panel. Um, I'm just sort of looking at some of the questions that are coming in, and the first question that popped up was one that I was going to ask anyway. But how would somebody who's just getting started and wants to get their music out there? I mean, from all three of you, what would your what would you advise? I mean, what should they choose? Which route should they go? What do they need? I, think, I wonder if I, I should think you, let you sort of, did you want, if you want to go right ahead. I was going to say, I'll <laughs> let, you know, someone else start this first. <laughs> uh, like possibly Melissa would be great to hear from, of course. Uh, let me, um, I mean, I feel like my experience was a little bit of a lottery situation uh, in some ways uh, because I got my first kind of big piece out there with a media splash that happened uh, it, back in 2009 on the Rachel Maddow show. Um, I, you know, the, the trickiest thing, if we're talking specifically orchestral music, I think the hardest thing for most composers who desire to write orchestral music is getting it, getting that first performance, getting a recording, like figuring out how to get that first performance, which you can then use to, you know, tell other people like, hey, here is my orchestral piece and get it further out there. Um, 
I mean, organizations like American Composers Orchestra obviously have calls for scores where you can get your pieces read by an orchestra, which is such an important thing. Um, the easiest path, of course, is to be at a muse an institution, a college or a conservatory or whatever that has an or orchestra who will be willing to read or perform things that you uh, compose. Um, I would advise someone who isn't in school who is wanting to write for orchestra to find local community orchestras or even high school orchestras and approach the conductors and say, you know, I'm a local composer, I'm in your community, I'm writing music that is relevant to our community, can I write you a piece, would you be interested in reading a piece that I've written, here's an example of the score, that kind of thing. Um, what you shouldn't do is write a piece for an orchestra and then scattershot, like, you know, blow it at every major orchestra in the country because they will take your email or your score and they will throw it in the trash. They have absolutely no interest in cold calls from unknown orchestras who've written an orchestral piece and they've never heard it and, you know, nobody's ever played them before. Um, it's a lot of work. I mean, I'm just going to say, like, straight up, publicity is a lot of work and a lot of heartache and it's a grind like you have to be prepared to have people not be interested to have people say no and you have to keep going um, and that can be hard to do sometimes but if you're just getting started and you really believe in yourself that's kind of what you have to do to get yourself out there I think it's also important to try to separate yourself from the pack um, not to pigeonhole yourself but to define yourself in a way that you stand out for something because everybody's getting so many scores these days and everybody is overwhelmed. And I think the more you can define yourself, the, the better. And sometimes you need somebody to help you like, like a PR type person or a strategic planning kind of person, or sometimes you can sort of do it yourself, but to put a real plan in place and execute it and get the right kind of materials is critical. One thing I will say on top of that uh, is that if you are in school right now, network the heck out of <laughs> your, your, your peers when you're there because you will all go other places and you will all rise up together. And so always, my mentor once told me, be kind to everyone in this industry because you never know who is gonna end up where. Um, and I would say, especially if you're in school, that's actually advantage. the most important part of school. Like, uh, yes, theory, Absolutely. music history, all of that. That's very, that's important. It's important. But actually, the most important part of music school is networking with your fellow musicians. Because especially as a composer, like it's more important for composers than anyone else. Because for the most part, unless you're someone amazing like Pamela Z, you need other people to perform your music. You need them to be your champions. So you need to make those connections in music school uh, for people who are going to go out there and be professional musicians and play or perform your stuff. That's what you need. So yeah, I'm like, actually, in some ways, it's more important than the curriculum. And I'm saying this as a professor who has a curriculum. So a hundred percent. It's so great to hear people say the things that I always say to my students and hope other people will say to them too. It's funny, I had a, a brief conversation once with David Ling and we were talking about how the music world is so small and he was like, yeah, I think there's only like five people that are doing this. We just keep running into each other at, in different places. So um, yeah, so you never know when you're gonna rerun into the people who are sitting right next to you today. Um, the the yeah, other thing I would I would say too, and, and I'm speaking, you know, just looking at my experience of being in the new music community for the past like 10, 12 years, uh, you know, when you're starting out, you should really think about investing in the community around you. When you're first getting out there and people don't know you, start your own band, start your own collective, do things that really invest in the people around you, creating those relationships and doing something that is noteworthy, that will get other people's attention and that will start help, you know, then you get to work with someone with like Elizabeth who will help publicize you and, and get you lots of traction. And I think that's how it at least starts. 
And speaking of, of Elizabeth, there was a, a question for you um, on the opposite end about how you work with experienced composers and whether or not it's um, on a, a fee basis, a contingent basis. How does that that work? Um, we actually work on on a retainer uh, plus a small commission because we are PR offices. You know, once once we're working with you, we do everything together. Um, it's really, you know, we keep the roster small so that we can be very involved with everybody. And um, it's kind of all encompassing. So that's the way they, we, and of course, there's always, there are other exceptions. There's project basis for various things if something comes up. Um, but my feeling is you should always be thinking long-term strategy. Where do you wanna be in five years? Where do you wanna be in 10 years? And, you know, it's great to have one big, you know, PR pop for something that you've written, but what happens after? And we've all seen people who have, you know, had one great thing and had nothing to follow it up with. So I think it's important to, um, you know, even though projects can be great and useful, I think it's good to think of the bigger picture as much as you can. And I wonder, um, I mean, this is sort of a question for Melissa, but I'd love to hear from, from everyone on, um, and this is a, a question from the audience as well, like resources for composers who wanna handle the publicity on their own, who maybe don't have a publisher, don't have a publicist um, and just wanna handle it themselves. What would you recommend to people who are self-publishing? Okay, uh, for me, and I know Elizabeth just said, you know, uh, focusing on the project is great, but you should have a bigger picture. But for me personally, especially earlier on, focusing on the project really made me um, whittle down my publicity job to figure out who was going to be most interested in, the, in a project. When I sort of tell my students how to do publicity, it's basically like this. Figure out who your audience is. I mean, this is like basic publicity 101, right? Figure out who your audience is for this project. Who is going to respond to this project? Who do you want to have in this project? And then step two, of course, is figure out how to reach that audience. Uh, is there a conduit in between? Are there people in the media who have that audience's ear? Do you need to reach them directly? For me, at least, like every project is slightly different. If I have a project that is about a political issue, for example, which was, you know, my 2009 issue that got, uh, got on the Rachel Maddow show, it was a very political issue. I created a website for that project that was pretty squarely aimed at political reporters, like journalists, because I knew that they're the conduit between me and people who are interested in politics. And then I basically started local and kept working outwards, contacting journalists, trying to talk to them about this project, finding journalists who write articles about the very issue that I'm talking about and, you know, sending them messages or commenting on their articles uh, and establishing relationships with them. You know, it's really sort of from scratch. If your audience is someone much, is a much smaller audience, you know, it's how can you reach them? Can you reach them through Facebook? Can you reach them through Twitter? Can you reach them on Reddit? Like where are the places uh, online? Obviously everyone's thinking about online audiences now that you can reach those audiences. Um, the advantage of the professional publicist is that they've done a lot of that work already. They have contacts already. They have the ear of certain, you know, music critics or journalists that they can reach out to that they trust and they, you know, are trusted in return. Um, as someone on your own, especially just starting out, it can be a lot harder to, uh, to find the people who will, you know, have that relationship with you. But I can say that once you start doing it, once you start getting a little bit of traction there, it gets easier and easier as it goes on. It's it's finding the angles too. And it's finding different ways of looking at things, um, you know, also. And we, it's interesting because you, when you say publicity, it's a little bit different than the way I say publicity, but it's fascinating to to hear your perspective. And again- I would love to hear yours, yeah. And when, when people go to publicists though, um, they shouldn't expect quite something as all encompassing as, as what we're all really talking about because our office is a management office as well. We behave, you know, we do things a little bit differently. Straight PR offices really try to get stories and they're not necessarily doing all the other things, just as a point of clarification. 
yeah, that makes total sense. And I, I would expect, yeah, management and publicity, they interact, but they're also, they can well, they be should. separate and things. They yeah. should interact, but they usually don't. Yeah. <laughs> That's another conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think the other thing that you've got uh, going for you as a composer is that the new work that you're producing is noteworthy because it is new. I mean, there's so many different you know, string quartets out there who have recorded one more, you know, beta than quartet cycle. And I'm sure it's great, but when you're talking about something that's a world premiere recording or a world premiere in general, that's so much more interesting right off the bat to a journalist. Um, what I would say, looking at the field of what music journalism looks like right now, I think you, it's really great if you can think about a, the story and narrative behind uh, why you have written this piece, what makes it relevant to today, what makes it really speak to this moment, or, I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be political, but, you know, I think that is something that's very important for reader, the way that audiences even want to engage with uh, composers in general, they want to say, see, this is a living, breathing human person with interests and passions and who is thinking critically about this moment we're in and it's creating artwork that speaks to this moment. And I think that's always gonna create a very compelling story that, um, that journalists will bite into. Yeah, for better or worse, it is way more difficult for a composer to uh, publicize or get out there a work that's called, I don't know, symphony number no. four in E. You know what I mean? Like for better or worse, it is, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. Or if you just have like a string quartet whose ideas are purely about like music, you know, and if someone asked you, is there any programmatic link? You're like, no, it's just purely about harmony and melody. I mean, maybe you could you could um, find an angle in there that's like bucking the trend of you know programmatic music. That's kind of the 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 um, default at this moment. But having programmatic music means that you. Um, I, I sort of think of it almost as, you know, you double your chances of getting interest in it because people are interested in music and they also might be interested in the theme or the angle. I agree with that. That's very wise, Melissa. Yeah. Um, the, the other advice I would give though is to read widely the type of coverage that is out there and then you will understand what journalists, what types of stories they are interested in and you will maybe get an idea of like, that maps onto me as well, or this reminds me of another experience I had. And I think read to see what's being put out there, read to see who's covering peers of yours. And when you're looking for placement as well is very helpful. I mean, that might sound pretty basic, but um, that's definitely, I do a lot of research like that. And also, um, you, you know, getting out of the music pages, which I said before, but I can't stress enough how important that is. And these days, aside from the fact that there are just fewer and fewer writers, um, you know, writing about classical music, it's very hard to um, have these people pitch their editors. They just are not interested in classical music stories. Sadly, heartbreakingly, um, they think it doesn't sell. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard that on stories that really should have been no brainers. So basically, composers need to do something scandalous in order to catch the attention <laughs> of, the, of the. Okay, great. Um, uh, speaking of, you know, being relevant to right now um, and thinking about our current predicament in the last year, I wonder if any of you could talk about how your um, how your experience has changed, if it has changed at all. I wonder. You know, for Boozy and Hawks, has their business model shifted in any way? I wonder, for Elizabeth, um, are you doing promotion in a different way? And Melissa, I mean, has anything changed? I mean, it sounds like you were already pretty present. So I don't know. Uh, maybe, Caroline, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no overstating how much the pandemic has affected our industry, obviously, there, in, in so many different ways. I'll, I'll try to narrow in on just the logistical operations bit of it, since I know Elizabeth's gonna handle some of the promotion aspects of how to approach it. Um, you know, bef before the pandemic hit, in the, in the before days, uh, streaming really represented this, you know, tiny 
piece of the income pie. And then overnight, it became the entire pie. And so, so that just, I mean, irreversibly has changed the way uh, the publisher's relationship to collecting on streams and how we pursue them. And so, so overnight, we've had to really, our team has really had to pivot towards um, really being proactive and engaging with presenters and artists, many of whom were presenting in a digital space for the first time ever and, and didn't know necessarily that copyrighted music needs to be licensed, composers deserve to be paid, Conser composers have the right to say yes or no, I'm okay with you synchronizing my music to this video presentation. It's extremely important for our industry to understand that. And, and it's something that was not much of a priority before, um, but has become a huge priority for us now. Um, and so, so that was a that was a big change for us. It, I think it's hard to know at this point um, what that will look like in the future. I think a lot of presenters have said that they fully intend to continue um, weaving digital presentations into their their future programming. I think it's kind of hard once you stepped into the twenty first century to then you know step back. I, I think you know people have seen how, what a broader audience they can reach with digital presentations. And, but, but at the same time, uh, you know, we have re totally received rental inquiries for concerts in the fall that have no streaming on them. And we we're like, oh, huh. okay. Uh, I, okay, that's it. All right, their choice. So I, I guess it's a uh, time will tell on that one. Uh, maybe Elizabeth, I don't know if you want to talk about how your your business model maybe has been affected. Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I agree with what you said. I think it's maybe too soon to tell exactly what's going to happen. Because while I agree about all the streaming, I think people are, you know, chomping at the bit to get back to live concerts. And um, I think there may be some combination. Um, I've got a tour happening in the fall for chamber piece at, at major venues and a couple of the presenters called and said, well, you know, I think we're gonna be back, but maybe at half capacity and can we do a combination of live and streamed? So I think that's something that may become a little bit more prevalent also. So it's hard to tell. Um, all sorts of new rules and, and fees and all of the streaming, you know, that's a whole new, sort of chapter for us. And I do think it'll be around for a while. Um, and I think also the, just the effects of the pandemic uh, financially on our structure and on our industry are gonna affect things too. And we're not exactly sure how yet, but it's, it, it feels like people are waking up again. There was, a, there was a period a few months ago where you couldn't really reach anybody and they seem to be sort of in another place. But now, I mean, at least I'm having really active conversations about future seasons, signing some nice commission contracts. I've signed several major commission contracts in the last few months. And, you know, it feels like people are starting to think ahead again, which is great. It's watching all the vaccinations happen on social That's media, all of my friends in the medical industry getting vaccinated. And with every single one, I'm just cheering because I'm like, this is one step closer to yeah. live concerts happening again. Um, yeah. I think for me, I got so lucky career wise in that if this pandemic had happened five years ago, I think I would be kind of screwed. Like I just got to a point in my career where um, I had several large commissions that kind of, you know, the contracts got signed right before the pandemic hit so that I was able to keep that income. So, you know, I have an opera that I'm writing for Oberlin Conservatory, which is a three-year project. Uh, I'm writing a commission for Kaleidoscope Chamber Orchestra. Um, you know, these sort of larger works that take a longer time have sustained me. Um, I... Uh, I have had actually several commissions for virtual choir, which have come about as a result of the pandemic. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, people are asking for literature, which would be easy to record separately with each member of the choir recording their part separately. And that sort of puts you as a composer into a different brain space, treating the choir as a different instrument. I'm sure for 
you know, virtually recorded chamber music or orchestral music, you would also have to sort of think in a different way. You know, there's a, <laughs> how convenient that Bolero has a snare drum that goes the whole way through. So it was like the first virtual orchestra piece that Juilliard released, of course. <laughs> Very convenient. Thank you. Thank you, Ravel. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, the other thing that um, I think is uh, is has is going to be an interesting sort of thing looking forward is right from the beginning of the pandemic, panels like this, where I am joining uh, either, you know, uh, panels for Zooms or being able to talk to classrooms of people, of, of students in high school or in college or, you know, do webinars and things like that. That wasn't a huge part of my career before the pandemic. And now it's like I do two a week at least. Um, and I'm wondering post pandemic, I mean, you know, it's a pandemic, there's no real silver lining, but in a way that shift to sort of forcing a virtual environment for learning can actually broaden the horizons a little bit for educational opportunities like this where I mean this is so egalitarian right you didn't have to pay you can you can come in we can serve 300 people at a time whereas a regular in-person panel you know you could maybe get a couple dozen who could afford to live in the city where you're based <laughs> you know so um that's exciting to me. And I would like to see more of that going forward, even after the pandemic is over, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, I'm noticing there are a number of questions and I think it would have been great in hindsight to also have somebody from some of the PROs here um, to talk about all the issues of sync licensing and the whole wild west that that has become now that everything is streaming online. Um, Carol Ann, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all in terms from the the publishing house perspective. Was there a specific question that I can well, bounce off of? I, I guess I'll ask a question. Um, okay. From a composer's standpoint, um, the, it's sort of an unknown world of how one goes about pricing sync, sync lines, licenses for themselves for performances and um, you know, how much time, which ensemble, how do you deal with that? Um, you know, a lot of people are worried, like if it's on YouTube, am I getting royalties? Um, so I don't, I assume yeah. that with someone like Boozy, you handle a lot of those details in house for composers. I think it's very related as well to how do you price, you know, rental fees. And you have to really ask a lot of questions each time a, a, a sync uh, request comes through um, and, and whenever a sync request comes through we have people fill out a form that's pretty detailed you know where are you gonna where are they gonna be putting this stream how long is it gonna be out there how many people do you think are gonna be seeing this which might be hard to gauge but you know you can sort of see what you know capacity their channel is and I think there's so many you know you know, how many minutes of this piece are you going to be putting out there? It sounds so technical because you're just thinking about this is my baby. It's not reduced down to five minutes or, you know, but, but those are really, um, those are different details that you really should be considering when you are then trying to negotiate a, a fee. So I would, you know, and I can totally appreciate how complex this is for uh, the, uh, the large, the general public to understand, uh, well, what, what does a sync license even entail? Because, you know, it is actually changing week to week sometimes too from, from um, the, the NMPA. And so, so there, there's a lot to keep up with in this past year as well. Uh, but I would, I would say, take a look, ask a lot of questions, um, maybe gauge it off of how the pricing of your rental materials as a starting point. That's great. We're we're running pretty short on time. One last question I wanted to get in there because I hadn't actually had any experience with this, but someone was asking if anyone on the panel has had experience with Encoda, um, which is sort of a sheet music subscription type service. So I don't know if anybody can speak to, to that and how it's affecting your work in any way. Um, Boozy and Hawks is, um has a very strong relationship with Encoda. So when Encoda first launched, um, it was their hope that they would get all the major music publishers signed on to um, host their music 
uh, on this platform that so that people could pay a I think it's either monthly or yearly subscription, and then they have access to peruse um, across the entire Encoda database of of work. So that sales items like you know ensemble pieces or solo instrumental pieces, but it's also meant orchestral pieces, which is more relevant to this group. Um, so potentially an orchestra could rent a piece through Zinfonia, but then get all of the parts, the digital parts on Encoda, and then you could have an entire orchestra playing off of iPads. That was their, that was their vision. Um, how that has uh, played out during this past year, I think it's been an incredible resource. Uh, I've certainly pointed to it multiple times uh, when journalists come to me or different uh, musicians want to see a perusal score. We certainly point it that way, them that way. It's it's great to have a platform that's ready made right there, um, ready to be engaged with. That's great. Um, I think it was know, also intended to be very useful in universities in schools and classrooms as well. Um, so I'm actually curious if other people listening here have used it. I'd, I'd love to hear stories about that. So, you know, I know we're not opening that I up know this JW session. I know JW Peppa is uh, beta releasing a, uh, a similar kind of system for iPads for where you could rent things and have them on the iPads. And then at the end of the rental period, you know, the yep. score is recalled kind of thing. Um, and I'm really curious to see how that works. I think, you know, it's not gonna launch properly until the pandemic dies away because none of us can play music in person right now. <laughs> but um, I, you know, for me personally, I'm all for it because as it stands, you know, I'm very liberal with giving out my scores anyway. Um, but I also think that that's probably the way of the future to be perfectly honest, the old method of paper scores uh, that, you know, are printed out and photocopied and God knows what else. It's probably on its way out. That makes me sad to I hear. Know. I know, I know you've got this publisher here shuddering in her boots. I, I know. I, I mean, I don't want it to be necessarily, but it's kind of like, you know, 20 years ago, I remember saying to someone, CDs are going to be dead tech in 10 years. And that person was like, absolutely not over my dead body. You will never get rid of my CDs. And now, you know. Kids but vinyl's back. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, we've gotten back to the record. So does that mean we're going to start? Um, Sets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I guess time will tell. Um, this has been fabulous. You know, I feel like when when composers decide they're going to try to make some money from this thing, it's sort of like somebody just hands them the backpack and pushes them out of the plane and don't, they don't even show them how to use the parachute. Yes. Um, so I think these kind of conversations are great. I hope we get to do more of them. I, I can think of 10 more questions I'd love to ask each of you. Um, but on behalf of American Composers Orchestra and American Composers Forum, thank you so much for being a part of this uh, conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks.